Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France Venquet debate. We're looking at the announcement of the start of the offensive to retake Fallujah, the Sunni stronghold overrun by Islamic State militants nearly two years ago. We're doing so in the company of France Venquet's Wasim Nasser, his book, uh, the F ISIS, The Fait Accompli, the... What did you say? How would you translate fait accompli? You can say that they constructed their system, so it's, it exists. Okay, <laughs> the system is there. Uh, former UN General Dominique Trincon, welcome back. Welcome back to Michael Pregen of the Hudson Institute, who joins us from Washington, Washington, where we also find Abbas uh, Kadim of uh, the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins uh, University. Uh, just before the break, uh, Michael Pregen saying, you know, you need that Sunni force that's genuinely built up in order to take uh, Baghdad. Wasim Nasser, your reaction to that? Yes, of course. What I, what I have many, many examples in my, uh, in my book because I followed the situation since the beginning. So when Fallujah was taken, uh, by uh, by the Islamic State, they were welcomed by the population because we were in a very particular context. Because by the end of 2013, the beginning of 2014, there was peaceful demonstrations against the government of Maliki. But Maliki killed a deputy, Al Alwan, Al Alwan, which most of his tribe is against the jihadis. And then he was convicted to death just before Ramadi was fallen fully to the jihadis. And remember that Al Hashimi, the vice president was uh, accused of being a terrorist, and he flew to Kurdistan. So the Sunni population had no more representation, didn't see any legitimacy in the government of Maliki. So they welcomed the jihadis. And I have very, uh, very real examples, because I was in contact with many people in Fallujah. One of them was a student and he would demonstrate it peacefully. Then he took arms, but not under the banner of the Islamic State. And eight, nine months later, he was a jihadi from the Islamic State. And the last time I talked to him, he was willing to fight to death. And he's one of many. So this is why, because and because most or, or part of the Sunni population doesn't see any legitimacy in the government in Baghdad, but neither in their political representatives, because they see them as corrupt. They see them as a traitors. And this is why they have no refuge either than being forced, maybe, to be on the side of the jihadis. This is the fact today in, in Iraq. It's less the fact in Syria, because in Syria, the Sunni population still has today other options. But in Iraq, the situation is very complicated. And as uh, uh, Michael said it, the towns are being taken at a very high price. They are completely destroyed. So when Fallujah but, is being but, under siege for but let two me, years... But, but Abbas Kadim said it in part one of our discussion. What do you do? You can't wait forever. Yes, you can't. Maybe you can't wait forever, but this is no long-term solution. Al-Qaeda was evicted, and the Islamic State in Iraq was evicted from the cities in 2008, 2009. They were in the desert. There were a few. They came back stronger. So that they, even if they are rolled over militarily, they will come back even stronger if there is no political solution, viable political solution for this Sunni population. On the other hand, Iran is playing its own game. It's playing its own game in Iraq and in Syria. This is politics. This is state politics. But till the point there is no response, viable political response for the Sunni population, mostly in Iraq and in Syria, the same problem will come over and over again. Einstein said, you cannot uh, wish another outcome. If you, it's, uh, it's foolish to wish a new outcome by doing the same thing. Over and over again. Uh, Abbas Kadim, uh, the New York Times quotes a militia leader, uh, um, the head of the Abu Fadil al-Abbas militia, saying that Fallujah has been the stronghold since 2004 until today of terrorism. There are no patriots, no real religious people in Fallujah. It's our chance to clear Iraq by eradicating the cancer of Fallujah. How do you get leaders that the, uh, that, uh, the people of Fallujah can trust to enter the city? Well, um, I mean, before that, I really would like to quickly address what Michael said. Uh, Michael is... Uh, uh, I know he has hands-on experience on post-2003, but I don't know how much he knows about before 2003 of Iraqi history. I'm a historian. The ones who fought for Iraqi military were always 
the Shia make the backbone and the vast majority of Iraqi fighting forces. Also, Iraq is not a confederation of tribes where every territory has to recruit from its own. Uh, you know, you, you, whoever fights for liberating Iraq, um, recruited by the government, has to be drawn from all Iraq. And if you draw from all Iraq, uh, definitely you get the uh, the majority Shia. And you add to that is the fact that we know now are the Shia are about. Uh, the, the most of the willing to fight and along with others who are willing but not as uh, the same percentage. So that's pretty much what you know what what the gist of what I said and I know that Mike knows that very well. Uh, the, uh, the other uh, to your question, uh, uh, again, he does not represent the uh, the, the uh, gentleman you just quoted. He does not represent the uh, the Iraqi government, Abadi's position, and also all of the Iraqi officials are clear. But it's militias like his that are doing the fighting. Well, look, you know, even in armies, uh, have you ever read the statements attributed to George Patton and, and many others uh, when they go on the battlefield? And the battlefield, uh, you know, the rhetoric gets different to mobilize your soldiers, etc. And officers and also leaders of militaries uh, have always been saying colorful things. But at the end of the day, I mean, you can't control on what everybody else says. This is the flaw of what happens in Iraq when you are not really in 100 percent on control of who fights. Uh, that's what you get. It would be nice to have an Iraqi military that has clear policy and clear everything. Uh, and even the statements are made with accountability. But Iraq is not like that. So what he said, uh, you know, uh, nobody agrees with this uh, in, in that generalization. It's clear that Fallujah is a problem, and it has always been. It, it is the place where the Americans, we, had to fight many times. That was, the, you know, when they burned four of our fellow Americans and hung them on the bridge, and it continued uh, all along. So Fallujah is a troublemaking city. But to uh, blanket uh, sort of uh, describe it as everybody in Fallujah, that is not even... Uh, logical to say, uh, but again, that does not represent the position of the Iraqi government or all of the forces. It is a person right, who was me, caught on tape saying that. Let and me, definitely let me bring no in, one agrees with General this kind Tancon of this. statement. G General Trancon, your reaction? You know, I, I think that uh, really uh, uh, not drawing lesson from what's happened in Fallujah is uh, really a big mistake. I mean, the government uh, two years ago, all the uh, the Iraqi army disbanded. Uh, in front of uh, Islamic State first. Secondly, Fallujah was taken by Islamic State by the population of Fallujah because they had no confidence in the Iraqi government. There was no fight. And exactly, there was no fight at all. And so now, if you take back this city with only the, sh the shit militia, perhaps you will, f you will win the battle, but w you will lose the, the war because you are not building the future. You are not building a new Iraq, and a new Iraq made of Sunni and Shiite. Okay, so how do you win over, I'll put it this way, how do you win over the confidence quickly? Because the whole world is impatient for the end of ISIS-held territory. If you look at history, 2003, 2014, 11 years of that sort of government, Shirak, uh, Shiite government in, in Iraq. We are talking only of about two years and you've got to go back uh, quickly in two months of what's happened in 11, 12 years. So, I mean, you need to take time. In, in, the, no in the north, in the, in the, just remember that I, uh, uh, Islamic State was built by Iraqi people who were probably uh, people important in the uh, in the uh, Iraqi government and serv secret services prior to 2003, and they built they they system because they were not part of the system of the new system. So they built a new system. So if so you build a new system, you need to to take the people you can take in the system, and that's not the case currently. Michael Pregent. Uh Part of the solution, is it in Baghdad? How do you uh, bring Sunnis into the fold there? <clears throat> well, if we continue along this strategy, we're simply going to reset the conditions that led to ISIS to begin with. So we're simply going to go back to the days before January 2014 when ISIS went into Fallujah. And that's the same with the Mosul operation. Absent reconciliation, absent Sunni buy-in to Baghdad, uh, you're not going to build that Sunni trust. And, and the, the thing that's been degraded the most here is 
any confidence in the United States to use leverage with Baghdad to curb Iranian influence to build that trust. We, we literally have U.S. military officers on the ground getting on cameras in front of news uh, stations and saying there are no Shia militias involved in the Fallujah operation. When everybody on this panel agrees there are, that's a problem. You can't build Sunni trust in Baghdad when they don't see the U.S. properly aligned with what works, when they continue to see creeping Iranian influence. We've lost leverage with Baghdad. Unless we hug Baghdad tighter than Tehran is, we're not going to build that Sunni trust. And I, I, per, I do believe that, that Baghdad and Tehran are happy if ISIS continues to maintain control of some cities in Iraq, because it justifies this continuation of arming militias, uh, this continuation of Iranian influence. And this is the same thing we're seeing in Syria as well. So the U.S. has a major role here to do the right thing. The only reason the surge worked in 2007 and 8 was because we targeted Shia militias as well. I'm not talking about volunteers from Basra who are doing the right thing. I'm talking about Asab Ahlul Haq. I'm talking about Kitab Hezbollah. I'm talking about these new groups by Akram al Kabi and these other former uh, Shia terrorists that are now legitimate political parties with militias that seek to have major gains in the 2018 elections based on what they've been able to do against ISIS. And that's a huge problem. We're simply resetting the conditions, and it's, it's going to be Are you suggesting that the U.S. air support for Fallujah is a mistake? Yes. Yes. How do you differentiate between a bomb that's launched from a Shia militia and a U.S. aircraft? If a U.S. spokesperson gets on the ground and says, or gets on the air and says, that wasn't our bomb, who's going to believe that in Iraq? Let me ask G General Tankal, do you agree? Yes, I mean, if, if, of course, the U.S. bombers are in support of the Shia militia, uh, all the population will see the U.S. are supporting the Shia militia. And so uh, in Fallujah and in Sunni uh, uh, territory, it's a mistake, certainly. All right. There's, I, I, I might um, add something. Uh, today, uh, the, one of the media branches of uh, the Islamic State called Alayat issued a three minutes video showing Obama with President Putin, then uh, the Arabs that uh, betrayed them, then the Iranians, and saying that everybody is in a coalition against them. And this is what they are saying in the propaganda since day one. And today it is materialized when we see U.S. warplanes with Iranian uh, conseillers and with Shia fighters fighting them on the ground. So they are saying, look, we are fulfilling the prophecy. We are the real Islamic State. We are fighting everybody. And everybody is forgetting their own wars and leaguing against us. And this, is, this was today, a few hours ago. So this is, is to be taken into consideration because the, the attractiveness of the Islamic State is built on this perception of the war. Abbas Kadim, is it, was it premature then, this, uh, this offensive on Fallujah? No, it's actually overdue. Uh, Fallujah is a national security uh, issue for Iraq. It has, well, it should not have been allowed to, to fall into the hands of uh, uh, terrorists, but uh, now that it had, it should have been handled before anything. And I, among many other people, were always asking for clearing Fallujah before going farther, because this is the real threat to Baghdad. Uh, it's never premature. I think uh, the, what the Iraqi government uh, is doing now is the right decision. Uh, I also believe that the American uh, support for the operation is the right decision. Um, I can tell that uh, my colleagues who are saying it's not wrong decision is not on moral grounds, but on the fact that you cannot differentiate between, uh, you know, in other words, the U.S. is setting itself into uh, being blamed for something that someone else does because nobody tells what is doing, who is doing what. But uh, on moral grounds, on strategic grounds, I think the United States has done the right uh, Thing by supporting the operation and by helping clear Fallujah. You cannot do much in Mosul unless you secure everything between Baghdad and Mosul and around Baghdad to the borders from east and west. All right, and the, so it's important. And the U.S. present on several fronts when it comes to that battle across two borders, again into Iraq and also in Syria, after the images uh, broadcast by France 24 last month, more images have surfaced of what are allegedly U.S. forces aiding Syrian Kurdish fighters, sometimes even wearing the YPG insignias. And while the Pentagon denies or sidesteps the question, the Kurds, well, they're unabashed. 
Of course, the American coalition forces are here and have been positioned all along the front. They're taking part both on the ground and in the air. The coalition's airplanes helped us to shell the Islamic State group's positions and strongholds. The forces on the ground are for communicating with the airplanes and providing intel. Not everyone's pleased, though, with those U.S. special forces in Syria. Dateline, Ankara, capital of Turkey. We advise U.S. soldiers to wear the insignia of the Islamic State group, al-Nusra and al-Qaeda when they go to other regions in Syria. They can even wear the insignia of Boko Haram when they go to Africa. And if they say, we don't see the YPG and these terrorist groups as the same, my answer is that they are being two-faced. I'll say this openly, they are being two-faced and applying a double standard. Michael Prejan, what say you to the Turkish foreign minister? Um, you know, I was an embedded advisor with the Peshmerga, and we wore stuff with them because we were fighting in Mosul in 2005. Uh, at an embarrassing situation where a Sunni commander came into our base in Mosul, and I was wearing a black knit cap with a Kurdish flag on it. So he automatically looked at me and said, "You're a, you guys are not legitimate. And, and, you know, he's right. We shouldn't be wearing that stuff. But it's, it's just the way it goes. When you're fighting with somebody against al-Qaeda or against ISIS, you do that. But having said that, uh, we shouldn't because it sends the wrong message. It's alienating. If you look at Raqqa and you look at the force that we're building, we're doing it with Yazidis, Christians, and Kurds to go into Raqqa. And what that's doing, again, what it does to Sunnis across, across the northern Middle East is it says, the U.S. is working with an invading force. And whether these Sunnis join ISIS or simply take up a weapon in armed resistance, it's because the force we're using, they're not the right ones. They may be the right ones to clear, but they're not the right ones to hold territory. You can only hold territory, and I would argue clear territory, with a trusted force. And the more we uh, fall back on wearing patches of other units and, and aligning that way, it just it's, it's a great bonding moment with the force you're embedded with, but it has uh, strategic consequences when you actually alienate those you're actually trying to but go But Michael President, how do you do it? The, the whole world uh, wants to get rid of ISIS to them to no longer hey, have you, their so-called caliphate. The, the, do, how does the U.S. <laughs> help in that battle? We know that airstrikes can only have a limited effect. If the whole world cares about defeating ISIS, then the whole world should get involved. You know, this coalition is flags only, PowerPoint presentations only. Let's get some people on the ground to actually build credible forces. Syria is 80 percent Sunni. Tell me where that Sunni military Jamal force is being built, a secular nationalist one, not an Islamist one, but a secular nationalist one. It's not being built. Show me where the Sunni force in Iraq is being built, absent the constraints of Tehran and Baghdad. It's not being built. I believe that ISIS is too dangerous to lead to a disinterested White House and an unfocused Baghdad. It's becoming too dangerous. We're not doing anything but burning down a house to rid it of some rats, and then the rats come back when you build the house up. We're doing nothing that strategically defeats ISIS in either Iraq or Syria. General Tancon, your reaction and your thoughts as a French citizen on what the French government should be doing? Yeah, I, uh... I will not dwell on what the French will uh, sh should do, but Raqqa is very important because Raqqa is shown to everyone at uh, the heart of the Islamic State, first thing. Secondly, for weeks and months, we haven't, been her uh, we haven't uh, listened to a word about the free uh, Syrian forces, and suddenly they are here. Suddenly. Why? Because they are not able to discuss in Geneva, so they need to win a battle. And so the U.S. pushed them to win a battle in Raqqa, which is very, very important in the eyes of the world, and then to give them power when they will discuss at the table uh, around the, uh, in Geneva, exactly like the, the Russian did in Alep and in Palmyra for the government of uh, Bashir al-Assad. And so I think it's a very short-term uh, effect because uh, the, the U.S., are obliged to be committed because the Syrian forces, the free Syrian forces are not 
powerful enough to win in Raqqa. So the Americans were obliged to, to, to get involved in this battle, and I think it's a very short-term objective. But I'm not sure that they will w really win in this area. But it's also uh, rolling the dice, because the, uh, the demo Syrian democratic forces that you are talking about aren't even accepted in Geneva. They mm -hmm. are not accepted by other opposition factions. The United States wants to put them in, Russia wants yeah. to put them in, but they're not in yet. So it's really rolling Wasim, the dice. at the end of the day, putting pressure on ISIS from three sides now, uh, on the Syrian side, on that road to Raqqa, in the north, near Mosul, in the south, uh, near Fallujah, is that going to bear fruits, though? Listen, we can win militarily by, uh, by having this huge force, air support, militias on the ground, uh, but uh, you are not winning hearts and minds if I may uh, speak this way. Because all the elements, all the ingredients of another Islamic State or another force like the Islamic State or more radical than the Islamic State are still there. Because the bet is being made one more time as in the beginning of the last century on minorities. Because Shias as a whole are a minority in the region. So what is the perception of the West by the people of the region, by the major Sunni majority? Because what Michael said is very important. It's, war is about perception also. Even if the but, U.S. fight... The but US if they commandos, lose battles, then they're no longer the ones winning all the time. Isn't but that who's winning? their perception? Who's winning? That's the point. Who's winning? Is, there, is the forces winning being considered as, their, as a friendly force by the population? Or not? When Shaddadi was taken with American support, 30,000 people flew Shaddadi. They didn't go find refuge in the Kurdish areas. They went to Deir Zur to the regions of the Islamic State. So this is to be taken into consideration because it is very serious. And when we talk about the YPG badge on the hands of the military, it's really understandable for military reasons. But the perception, there is war and there's the perception of war. It's old as history of war. Klausowicz said it. There is war, winning a battle, and there's winning the war. There's the real victory and perception. When Napoleon took Moscow, he won. But the perception was a big defeat. So this is what is to be shaken into consideration. We shouldn't be short-sighted uh, and make the same mistakes again and again and again. Wasim Nasser, I want to thank you. I want to thank General Dominique Trincon, Michael Pregent in Washington, Abbas Kadim also in Washington. Thank you for being with us here. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. And we say hello to James Creedon. Hi, Francois. Just to look at how this is playing out online, on social media, etc. You have a photo that we're going to start with by uh, the Reuters news agency taken yesterday, showing a member of the uh, Iraqi security forces firing artillery during clashes with the Islamic State militants near Fallujah. So we're getting a, a certain sense of, of, of what's happening uh, via images like that being transmitted on social media. This is also on Twitter from... The Middle East Eye, the battle for Fallujah's, uh, for Iraq's Fallujah, the city of Mosques, and they have various maps going up here as well, indicating, uh, I suppose, uh, the strategic importance of the city. Um, what else do we have? There is um, aerial views as well showing that the vital Al Nuamia area in the south of Fallujah, there are reports that that has been liberated. So you're getting. Uh, you know, on social media, I suppose, a what, sense of the what, progress of the offensive. Let me ask Wasim because. That's basically your job at France 24, is to, is to monitor things, especially because this is an area where reporters are having a difficult time accessing the story. Uh, uh, what is your sense on how Fallujah is re being reported? Actually, we are really dependent on official sources, as, uh, as always, as with Tikrit, as with Beji, and we have uh, conflicting uh, reports all the time. So uh, the thing is that when we have official sources, we should say, as official sources said, because this morning one official source said they went into the town, which was untrue. And another official source says, no, no, it's not true. No, I mean, yeah, the fighting is ongoing. They took uh, a, a small part of it, but it's a war. And when there's a war, there's uh, psyops, as we say. So there are operations in order to uh, make uh, the enemy uh, look weaker or uh, to, have, to make him have doubts. And this, as journalists, we should take this into consideration and be very careful while uh, covering uh, this kind of, uh, of a conflict. 
Uh, also on social media, you have the UNHCR talking about uh, the refugees who have managed to escape from Fallujah. F the figure that is being circulated is about 800 people. Uh, they've been putting up videos of uh, some of those people, for example, a mother of uh, three uh, who is giving her account of fleeing uh, the city. So attention being drawn to the refugee uh, element of uh, this um, conflict. There is a hashtag being used as well very much in support of the Iraqi armed forces, a hashtag that looks like it was probably created indeed by... the. That's a long people. hashtag. It's not a very natural looking, <laughs> kind of spontaneous looking hashtag. Stand with Iraq against ISIS and messages of support for uh, the Iraqi armed uh, forces going up under that hashtag. Um, I'm showing you the ones in English, there are obviously others uh, in Arabic and a lot of them optimistic we will win with images of uh, the armed forces and uh, very much a lot of... Uh, criticism and negative comments for uh, ISIS. Bob. All right, many thanks uh, for thanks that, James Creed. And I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.